session of the academic staff. Uh, this will be commenced by a fanfare of music. Um, when, the f when you hear the fanfare of music for the procession to begin, could I ask you please to rise at that, at that time and remain standing until the procession is seated on stage. The other thing we are asked to remind you of is that in this auditorium, flash photography is not permitted. <laughs> so could I ask you for the comfort of others uh, that you don't use flash photography during the proceedings. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Swannell, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Southern Queensland. Professor Max Standage, 
who was Pro Vice Chancellor of Science and Quality, but tonight is also Acting Pro Vice Chancellor of Gold Coast and Acting Vice Chancellor of the University. Members of Council, distinguished guests, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Mr John McCrossan, Chancellor of Griffith University and the Council of the University, I am pleased to welcome everyone present this evening and to thank you for joining us on what is a very special occasion. Graduation ceremonies are part of the rich tradition of universities worldwide. They are a public acknowledgement of the achievement of the graduating students and of course they are an opportunity for family, for friends and for peers to join in the celebration of those achievements. Our graduates will shortly come forward to be individually acknowledged and to receive their testimonies. We will share their pride and we will congratulate each of them on their achievement. This evening we extend a special welcome to Professor Peter Swannell. Professor Swannell is Vice-Chancellor of the University of Southern Queensland and we are delighted that Professor Swannell has been able to join us this evening and we shall look forward to hearing him deliver the occasional address later in the proceedings. Many of you may not be aware that Griffith University is now the eighth largest university in Australia in terms of funded student load. We are, as you know, a multi-campus institution with six campuses in the Brisbane Gold Coast Corridor and more than 21,500 students enrolled in an impressive array of undergraduate and postgraduate courses. Demand for university places in South East Queensland has increased in the face of declining demand in other states. Over the last four years, Griffith and the other universities in Queensland have actively, actively lobbied both the federal and the state governments for additional student places to meet that demand. Those efforts have resulted in over 3,000 new undergraduate places being awarded to Griffith for the period from 1995 to 1999. Sixty per cent of those places have been allocated to the university's Gold Coast campus and the remainder to our new campus at Logan. Whilst we are pleased with this outcome, we will continue to argue the case for additional places to ensure that the communities that we serve have the best possible access to tertiary education. The demands of teaching and the demands of research in a multi-site institution with staff and students accommodated at campuses located along a 70 kilometre corridor are complex. New faculties, new schools which transcend campus boundaries have been established to foster academic coherence in teaching and research and to provide a greater range of academic opportunities for students of all campuses. Our multi-campus operation is supported by a microwave link connecting the universities Nathan, Mount Gravatt, Logan and Gold Coast campuses. This telecommunications backbone provides high speed transmission of image, sound and data between the campuses and provides a great degree of flexibility in the delivery and access of information for teaching, for research and for administrative purposes. Griffith University's new campus at Logan, which admitted students in February of this year, has been designed around learning centres. All subjects offered at the Logan campus have been developed in a flexible delivery mode, which permits students to access course material through a variety of options, including interactive multimedia via the internet. The university will use the Logan campus as an exemplar for the introduction of flexible learning opportunities for students on all campuses over the coming years. The university's multimedia distance learning network has been presented with a medal for our entry for a Computer World Smithsonian Award, which identify and honour the visionary use of information technology to produce positive social, economic and educational change. 
Griffith University's entry for the award is a case study on the communications network which links our six campuses. And this case study will remain part of the permanent reference collection at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. Our students graduating this evening come from schools within several faculties. The faculties of Arts, Commerce and Management, Education, Engineering, Environmental Sciences, Health Sciences, Information and Communication Technology, Nursing and Health and the Graduate School of Management. These schools and faculties have recorded a number of significant successes in the past year which deserve mention. Across the Faculty of Arts, there has been very promising developments that will place Griffith in a strong position at a time in which the arts area at other universities has been drastically diminished. The School of Film, Media and Cultural Studies and the School of Arts has introduced a new cross-campus major in journalism to meet heavy student demand. The major in journalism gives students professional level experience in using the latest communication techniques. The School of Film, Media and Cultural Studies has in fact introduced a training course in media communications for the staff of Fairfax Holdings in Sydney. Quite a coup for the university. The School of Justice Administration has introduced a Bachelor of Arts in Justice Administration via open learning. The School of Justice Administration is well advanced with planning for a Master of Arts in Forensic Psychology for introduction in the year 2000. The School of Humanities has established a partnership with the University of Innsbruck in Austria for the development of flexible learning and literary studies. The School of Humanities continued its leading national role in the development of Australian studies in Asian countries, including Thailand, China, Taiwan, Korea and Japan. In February of this year, the school hosted a visit by nine professors from leading universities in Taiwan for a professional development course in Australian studies. Three academic staff from the school will be teaching Australian studies at the Beijing Foreign Studies University during 1998. Among our graduates tonight are the first to receive the Master of Hospitality Management degree that has been delivered offshore in Singapore. Among those enrolled in the Master of Hospitality Management courses are employees of major tourism and hotel companies. Three new courses begin on the Logan campus this year within the Faculty of Commerce and Management and they are courses leading towards the Bachelor of Management, Bachelor of Enterprise Management, Bachelor of Business Communication. Next year we will see the commencement of the Bachelor of Commerce and Finance Planning and Investments. The School of Education and Professional Studies has in association with the Queensland Board of Teacher Ed Registration, Education Queensland and the Queensland Teachers Union pioneered in Queensland the development of a school-based internship in its Bachelor of Education program at the Gold Coast. This internship provides graduates with an authentic and rigorous preparation for their employment. In addition, in the new Bachelor of Education, the school will offer Queensland's first education major in learning technology, so the graduate teachers are able to competently lead their students into the next millennium where access to information and access to technology will be essential. A new specialised learning technology centre will be opened by the school this semester to enable students and teaching staff from local schools to study in the area of learning technology. The School of Curriculum, Teaching and Learning has extended community and partnership links through two allied centres, the Centre for Leadership and Management in Education and the Centre for Movement Education and Research. The latter now offers programs for children with motor coordination difficulties, programs in health and fitness and in sport and in performance psychology. 
This centre will host an international golf science conference on the Gold Coast in the week before the Sydney 2000 Olympics. The School of Engineering has demonstrated an innovative approach to disciplinary developments in such unique degree programs as the Coastal Engineering major, which has been recently approved for offer in the first semester of 1999. A very appropriate engineering major when you think of where we sit in this great country of ours. That major will cover such subjects as coastal systems, coastal and estuarine hydrodynamics, coastal engineering design, coastal zone management and coastal modelling. There are other innovative approaches in the pipeline. The School of Engineering is planning to introduce a full four-year coastal engineering degree course, which again will be the first of its kind in this country. In order to capitalise on these ventures, the University has recently invested in the state-of-the-art research vessel for coastal engineering studies. The September graduation ceremonies are a milestone for the Faculty of Health Sciences. The first cohort of diplomats in the graduate diploma in sport physiotherapy received their awards later this month. That course has been delivered in a more flexible mode than has traditionally been the case and this has proved popular with students and has contributed to a high retention rate. A number of diplomats are proceeding to the Master of Sports Physiotherapy. From 1999 the University will be offering a joint degree in exercise science and physiotherapy and from 2000 a graduate diploma in physiotherapy building on the Bachelor of Exercise Science will be offered. These developments extend significantly the University's offerings in the health professions. The first student to graduate with a Bachelor of Biomedical Science from the Gold Coast campus receives her award with two graduates in the Bachelor of Health Science at a ceremony later this month. The expansion of offerings is being matched by an expansion of academic staff in health science with the school growing from five to 14 staff in the space of two years. This increases the school's capacity to contribute to the university's research mission, which in the health science area has been given significant impetus by the recent decision by the Council of the University to establish a Griffith Institute of Medical Research. This graduation this evening also sees the first cohort of <coughs> graduates to attend the award of Master of Business Administration International. The MBA International degree was established in 1997 to cater for growing demand from academically well-qualified local and overseas graduates for an MBA which does not require significant work experience. The course provides an excellent stepping stone for recent graduates to obtain a strong advantage in the career market in what is an increasingly competitive marketplace. In that increasingly competitive marketplace, our MBA and related courses are holding their own well with intake numbers continuing to increase. This increase of market share is very gratifying and is largely due to Griffith University's reputation and the quality of our Master of Business Administration course. The Software Quality Institute in the School of Computing and Information Technology last year played a major part in the submission to the federal government to establish a national software engineering network. This network will have nodes in all capital cities of Australia. The Software Quality Institute will be responsible for one of the major national projects, a national industries improvement program. The Software Quality Institute will also play a major role in other industry training, technology transfer and standards activities. The initial grant for that network was $9 million, $7.5 million of which came to Queensland. And in addition to this, the federal government has earmarked another $28 million over the next four years 
to fund, fund software engineering activities and testbed facilities for the network. The last 12 months has seen the amalgamation of the schools of nursing on the Nathan and Gold Coast campuses, with 1998 seeing the introduction of a school of nursing at the Logan campus. The combination of all three schools means a more dynamic approach to teaching. Across campuses, there has been input from academics with a wide variety of teaching backgrounds and the introduction of uniformity of approach, particularly in relation to the Bachelor of Nursing post-registration on both the Nathan and Gold Coast campuses. In the postgraduate area, the school has introduced many more courses designed for the professional nurse to target a specialised field of study. New courses have been developed according to perceived demand and feedback from professional bodies and include amongst the well-established courses of midwifery, mental health, emergency and critical care nursing, palliative care, community health nursing and loss and grief. Some of these courses will be offered in flexible mode to accommodate nurses in rural areas and in response to the huge demand for flexibilised learning. The School of Nursing has also made great inroads into the international sector, with its Bachelor of Nursing post-registration being taught offshore in collaboration with the Nisiken Corporation in Japan. This has proven extremely popular, with consistently high enrolments for the course in Tokyo. We have also conducted study tours for Japanese nurses visiting Nathan campus from the Tokyo Medical College with visitors numbering as high as 90 at any one time. International students remain a high priority within the school and we intend to expand our courses to encompass other countries in the future. Let me return to the focus of our gathering here this evening. We have gathered to give rightful recognition to you, our students, who have completed your course of study and who will shortly receive your awards. All of you have demonstrated a command of the knowledge and skills necessary for your chosen field of endeavour, as well as a willingness to persist with the level of discipline needed for high achievement in any field. Together, these qualities provide an excellent foundation for establishing a successful career. You are entering a very competitive world, a very competitive world with a growing global focus. In particular in Australia, we need to make our way in what will be an increasingly competitive Asian Pacific region. And whilst we have seen the events of the Asian economies of recent times, one of the upturns of that is that they will each become much more competitive than they've been in the past and we need to match it. I encourage you all to use your tertiary education as a sound base, a base on which to build your career, recognising that in many ways you are now embarking on what will be a lifelong learning experience. As we continue with this evening's proceedings, I again express my warm congratulations to each of our graduates and wish them every success in the future. Thank you. I now call on the deans to present the graduates from their respective faculties who are to receive their awards at this ceremony. Deputy Chancellor, Professor David Saunders, Dean of the Faculty of Arts. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Arts. 
Peter Ball. <laughs> Bettina Feets. <laughs> Alexandra Jones. David Laurie. Melita McConaughey. Kirsty Withington. Deputy Chancellor. I present graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Arts in Communication. Nicole Baden. Anita Laucanon. Diane Reynolds. Blair Webster. <laughs> Deputy Chancellor, I present a graduate who has been granted the Bachelor of Arts in Creative Arts, Catherine Coburn. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Arts in Japanese. Sheridan Hargraves. <laughs> Stephanie Clug. <laughs> Sue Park. Sasha Reza. May So. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the graduate certificate in film and television music. Timothy Chong. Juyon Nam. Deputy Chancellor, I present a graduate who has been granted the Master of Arts, Aspa Papa. Deputy Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Arts. Deputy Chancellor, Professor Drew Nesdale, Acting Dean of the Faculty of Commerce and Management. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, Iona Abrahamson. Natasha Golden. Mark Jackson. Catherine Langford. Kylie Stubbs. Congratulations. 
Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Business. Kylie Allsop. Renee Betteridge. Trina Chin. Grace Chung. Matthew Clunes. Heather Dickinson. Daniel Dunn. Rebecca Farley. Tracy Goodchap. Nicholas Harris. Carl Jensen. Brett Kennedy. Louise Kwok. Simon Lee. Jennifer Manangaya. Del Martin. Natalie McMahon. Cameron Mitchell. John Moody. Carolyn Murray. Karen O'Brien. Kiyo Otai. June Po. Catherine Rainey. Natalia Ricciuti Walker. Sarah Roddick. Rahman Sana. Jeff Slatcher. Kate Smith. Megan Fode. Mark Tidbury. Usana Waiponksa. Alexandra White.
Carol Wright. Yin Yang. Fan Yi. Deputy Chancellor, I present two graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Business and Bachelor of Arts in Japanese. Nadia Abdul Khalik. Narelle Percy. <laughs> Deputy Chancellor, I present a graduate who's been granted the Bachelor of Business and Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, Rachel McLaughlin. Deputy Chancellor, I present a graduate who has been granted the Bachelor of Business in Professional Golf Management, Trent Warland. Deputy Chancellor, I present a graduate who has been granted the Bachelor of Business in Retailing Management, Suzanne Hibbard. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Hotel Management. Nalia Alamova. Linda Bamford. Marcus Hall. Marga Dupathi Siva Lingam. Sulis. Charmaine Van Eyck. Deputy Chancellor, I present a graduate who has been granted the Bachelor of Hotel Management and Bachelor of Arts in Japanese, Vanessa Falzen. <laughs> Deputy Chancellor, I present a graduate who has been granted the Bachelor of International Finance, Ling Li Du. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Master of Hospitality Management. Muriel Chen. Marcus Li Yong Quang. Po Kim Quek. Audi We. Audrey Wong. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Master of Professional Accounting, Olivia Alton Kaya. Mark Coulter. Stuart Rowe.
Deputy Chancellor, I present two graduates who have been granted the Master of Tourism Management, Guy Cantrell. Margie McGregor. Deputy Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Commerce and Management. Deputy Chancellor, Professor Marilyn McMenamin, AM, Dean of the Faculty of Education and Acting Pro Vice Chancellor, Equity. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Education, Elizabeth Anderson. Lisa Davidson. Grace Gobi. Fiona Zielke. Dep Deputy Chancellor, I present two graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Teaching, Juliet Adult Kelly. Karen Ellis. Deputy Chancellor, I present two graduates who have been granted the Graduate Certificate in the Teaching of English as a Second Language, Thora Carroll. Daphne Shearer. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Master of Education Studies, Rajen Chetty. Margaret Hamilton. Sheila Martineau. and Tunnicliffe. Deputy Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates of the Faculty of Education. Deputy Chancellor, Professor Barry Harrison, Dean of the Faculty of Engineering. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Engineering in Civil Engineering, Grant Carpenter. Alan Holloway. Jason Lanigan. And Yvonne Pavek. Deputy Chancellor, that concludes presentation of the graduates of the Faculty of Engineering.
Deputy Chancellor, Professor Roy Rickson, Acting Dean of the Faculty of Environmental Sciences. Deputy Chancellor. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Science. Melanie Carlos. Anita Leong. Deputy Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates of the Faculty of Environmental Sciences. Deputy Chancellor, Professor John O'Gorman, Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences. Deputy Chancellor, I present a graduate who has been granted the Bachelor of Biomedical Science, Rachel Perla. Deputy Chancellor, I present two graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Health Science. Reagan Burr. Catherine Forrest. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Graduate Diploma of Sports Physiotherapy. Louise Eddy. Paul Ekman. Andrew McGuff. Richard Newton. Bruce Rawson. Lindsay Trigar. Philip Walsh. Deputy Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Health Sciences. Deputy Chancellor, Professor Paul Pritchard, Dean of the Faculty of Information and Communication Technology. Deputy Chancellor, I present two graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Information Technology. Philip McDermott. Boone Tan. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Master of Computing. Reiji Yappan. Premchit Himawath. Sanjay Punjari. Fabian Rodrigo. Ravi Vegesina. Deputy Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates of the Faculty of Computing and Information Technology.
Deputy Chancellor, Professor Anne McMurray, Dean of the Faculty of Nursing and Health. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Bachelor of Nursing. Eva Balai. Nair Chick. Leanne DeMello. Julianne Farrington. Craig Fossey. Debbie Gordon. Geraldine Hughes. Alice Selvey. Roseanne Storr. Deputy Chancellor, I present a graduate who has been granted the Graduate Diploma of Emergency Nursing, Graham Somerville. Deputy Chancellor, I present two graduates who have been granted the Master of Emergency Nursing, Kay Ahern. Karen Champion. Deputy Chancellor, I present two graduates who have been granted the Master of Nursing. Trudy Hancock. <laughs> Joe Ellen Reed. Deputy Chancellor, that concludes the presentations from the Faculty of Nursing and Health. Deputy Chancellor, Associate Professor Trevor Mules, Acting Director of the Graduate School of Management. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates who have been granted the Master of Business Administration. Varma Upalapati. <laughs> Shan Walden. <laughs> Jill Watts. Lee Zhao. Deputy Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates of the Graduate School of Management. Deputy Chancellor, Professor Max Standage, Acting Vice Chancellor, will now present graduates for the award of Doctor of Philosophy. Deputy Chancellor, tonight the University is proud to honour two graduates who have satisfied the rigorous criteria for the award of the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Deputy Chancellor, the following graduate has been granted the degree of Doctor of Philosophy taken on the Faculty of Commerce and Management, Dr Brown.
Dr. Brown's thesis examines the reasons for the low proportion of women who attain senior positions in the paid workforce. Taking a break from full-time employment, regardless of its length, was found to greatly reduce the chances of being in a senior position, and women were more likely than men to take career breaks. Thus, initiatives allowing women time away from full-time work to combine work and family may be hindering the careers of women. The thesis highlights the way in which traditional career management strategies, which do not allow people to combine work and family, are those rewarded in the paid workforce. Deputy Chancellor, I present Dr. Claire Rosemary Brown. Deputy Chancellor, the following graduate has been granted the degree of Doctor of Philosophy taken in the Faculty of Law, Dr. Robertson. <laughs> Dr. Robertson's thesis examines the history of land law in South Africa. It includes an historical account of the development of apartheid land legislation and offers an analysis of the dilemmas and possibilities of land reform in the post-apartheid era. Drawing on evidence from other jurisdictions, especially from South America, Dr. Robertson's thesis considerably advances our understanding of the relationship between land law and constitutional change, and the relationship between land rights and democratic participation. Deputy Chancellor, I present Dr. Michael Keith Robertson. Deputy Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates. There will now be a short musical interlude performed by the Griffith University Collegiate Singers.
It gives me pleasure now to call upon the Acting Vice-Chancellor, the Pro Vice-Chancellor of Science and Quality, Professor Max Standage, to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Professor Standage. Professor Peter Swannell, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Southern Queensland. Mr Norm, Norman Fussell, Deputy Chancellor, Griffith University. Members of Council, distinguished guests, graduates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Professor Webb, Vice-Chancellor of Griffith University, I am pleased to welcome everyone present this evening and to thank you for joining us for this very special occasion. I'm particularly pleased to welcome and introduce Professor Peter Swannell, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Southern Queensland. Professor Swannell began his career as a steel designer with Dorman, Long and Company in the north of England before becoming a lecturer in civil engineering at the University of Birmingham from 1962 till 1970. He has a degree in civil engineering from the University of Bristol and a PhD from the U University of Birmingham. In 1970, he worked for W.S. Atkins Group in London he is a chartered civil engineer in the United Kingdom and a fellow of the Institution of Engineers Australia. Professor Swannell is the author of a textbook on theory of structures, numerous journal articles, conference proceedings and research reports. His major teaching and research interests have been in structural engineering and engineering computing. He came to Australia in 1971 and worked at the University of Queensland as a senior lecturer and as a reader in civil engineering before moving to the University of Southern Queensland. He has served as the university's foundation professor of engineering and dean of the faculty of engineering and surveying for five years. He was appointed pro vice chancellor research and higher degrees in 1995. In December 1996, he took up his current position as vice chancellor of the University of Southern Queensland. I now call on Professor Swannell to deliver the occasional address. Deputy Chancellor, Acting Vice-Chancellor, most distinguished guests, graduates and ladies and gentlemen, I greatly appreciate the element of bravery in asking a foreign Vice-Chancellor to give the occasional address. No one should lightly be given an uninterrupted opportunity to say daft things, either by way of quite unsustainable praise about one's own institution or by quite unsustainable criticism of the host institution. How much worse it could be when the foreigner normally dwells at 700 metres above sea level, deprived day in and day out of the oxygen necessary to foster intelligence and a healthy mind in a healthy body. As a Toowoomba dweller in recent years, <laughs> there is a thrill in being able to come down from the mountain and share, no matter how briefly, the heady intellectual eddies of life on the coastal plain. As an engineer, normally regarded, therefore, as being drunk by this time in the evening, <laughs> my ability to say heady intellectual eddies is an act of defiance testifying to my sobriety in the face of so many alien discipline leaders. 
Most of what we say in Toowoomba inevitably goes over the heads of the city dudes. Indeed, in these times of enormous change and niche strengths, entrepreneurship and competition, often thinly disguised as cooperation between organizations possessing different but complementary skills, it is a relief when one can do things with an element of unnoticed stealth. It's a bit like that naughty old thing about the young bull and the old bull, except in the case of my own university, we're still rather young but rapidly growing old bull cunning. Deputy Chancellor, I'm delighted to be here and I thank you for your kind invitation. With graduates poised from every conceivable faculty and discipline, my chances of not offending at least 20% of the audience are negligible, <laughs> and my chances of satisfying the intellectual curiosity of a reasonable cross-section of your guests is even less. Here is an audience brimful of people who, for example, probably understand art. I like John Ciardi's description of modern art. Modern art, he said, is what happens when painters stop looking at girls and persuade themselves they've had a better idea. <laughs> he was the world's only armless sculptor, explained humorist Fred Allen. He put the chisel in his mouth and his wife hit him on the back of the head with a mallet. Art, like morality, said G.K. Chesterton, consists of drawing the line somewhere. <laughs> there will, of course, also be people present who understand about music. When it comes to music, I'm with the great Victor Borga, who, when asked what he knew about music, replied, I only know two pieces of music. One is Claire de Luna, and the other one isn't. Scientists who are present tonight will not understand that, that science is simple, at least from an engineer's viewpoint. If it moves, it's biology. If it stinks, it's chemistry. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, it's physics. <laughs> the scientific theory I like the best, said Mark Russell, is that the rings of Saturn are composed entirely of lost airline baggage. Ladies and gentlemen, we vice-chancellors are a weird mob. <laughs> I've just returned from the Association of Commonwealth Universities Quinquennial Conference in Ottawa with Professor Webb, incidentally, where in addition to listening to superb keynote addresses from former President Julius Nereri of Tanzania, I was able to spend far too much time with fellow vice-chancellors. I noticed that the Courier-Mail, for example, seized the opportunity presented by our absence to inform its readers that the difference between a vice-chancellor and a supermarket trolley was that there was a limit to how much food you could put in the supermarket trolley. <laughs> this, this is an old joke twisted from the more usual comparison between a professor of accounting and a supermarket trolley, where the difference between the two is attributed to the fact that a supermarket trolley has a mind of its own when pushed. Vice-chancellors, I learned in Ottawa, need to have only two characteristics to ensure their success. Firstly, a vice-chancellor must have a shock of white hair to convey a look of dignity. And secondly, a vice-chancellor must have hemorrhoids in order to convey a look of pained concern. <laughs> At least I've scored a bare pass in these criteria. So, whatever one's attributes, how does one address a graduation audience containing such a mixture of disciplines? We have a group of graduates containing many, I'm sure, who are sensitive, creative, widely read, brilliantly articulate people, whilst others are essentially drunken, unwashed, and largely illiterate. <laughs> so, engineers, please try to ignore the drunk, unwashed, and illiterate as we share our creativity with everyone present. Yes, indeed, we have the thinkers and the drinkers. What absolute nonsense it is to talk about the relative merits of studying science rather than the humanities, or business, or mathematics, or computing, or whatever. What nonsense is talked about whether proper universities, whatever they are, ought to provide vocational training, whatever that is, as opposed to a truly liberal education, whatever that means. What nonsense it is to think 
that because something is in danger of being useful, however you define that, then it probably ought to be taught within the TAFE sector rather than the university. <laughs> what nonsense it is to think that because something appears to be absolutely of no practical use whatsoever, that it must be a waste of resources to teach it. What nonsense it is to think that there is some mystical hierarchy of value to the community, usually as perceived by a Canberra bureaucracy driven by the whims of the government of the day that tries to determine the profile of a proper university. There is no better indication of the inadequacy of any university model which might emerge from preconceived notions about what disciplines ought to be taught in a university than to look at the cross-section of today's graduates. I'll come back to that importance of diversity, if I may, as I finish. In your university's publications, there's a brief history which refers to the enormous changes and developments that have occurred since this university opened in 1975. It talks of the tremendous growth and the widening of the profile of your university through the 1980s. It refers to recent years since the appointment of your Vice Chancellor, Professor Webb, in 1985. The history tells of Professor Webb's leadership as he steered the university through, quotes, the rapids of philosophical, economic, and social change which have occurred over the past decade in the higher education environment. With these rapids flowing so full, this must have been a significant feat. I might even be tempted, in view of the rapids analogy, to describe it as a web feat. <laughs> but I probably shouldn't. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've got some news for you. You ain't seen nothing yet. The provision of tertiary education opportunities to a vastly wider cross-section of the community as an inevitable consequence of the Dawkins reforms of the late 80s were themselves enough to create total change in people's attitude towards higher education. Add to that the absolutely mind-blowing changes in communications technology of the last five plus years and the potential for chaos is only exceeded by the potential for fantastic intellectual gains for the nation. Put very simply, this is the most challenging, the most interesting, and the most important time in the history of universities in this or any part of the world. I identify three key parameters in the changed attitude of all of us towards the provision of tertiary education opportunities. Firstly, the recognition that the base from which university students can be drawn is vastly wider than was ever dreamed of less than two decades ago. We have at last acknowledged that people develop to a stage where they can benefit from tertiary studies at different rates and from different social, economic, and cultural backgrounds. The simple fact is that the mature age student who, ha who was an underachiever when young may, for, re for many reasons, become an ideal candidate for successful tertiary studies. Personal motivation, sheer opportunity, personal relationships, workplace incentives, the fact that your kids are bright, the fact that the girlfriend keeps nagging you, all can combine to light a spark. People suddenly realize that their lives can be more fulfilled, happier, and more useful if they enter a carefully structured program of advanced education. Suddenly, they realize that although intelligence is an incurable disease, there is a palliative through the universities whereby they can live with the frustration of being critically ill. <laughs> Secondly, for the first time in the history of the human race, we can do more than just talk about lifelong learning. For the first time, we can break the shackles imposed by time, place, and pace, and allow people to have access to world-class educational materials in their place, in their time, and in their style. We can truly now give people what they want, where they want it, when they want it. And the fact that that's WWW is just a happy coincidence. <laughs> Thirdly, 
concurrent with these two exciting events, with this awakening for the need and educational opportunities throughout communities and the arrival of cheap, user-friendly technology, we're faced with government actions which have severely cut back the per capita contribution to education from the public purse. Just when we had the ability to deliver, politicians and bureaucrats lost their nerve and forgot that money spent on producing a highly educated, astute Australian population is an investment and not a cost. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we have three sometimes conflicting truths about today's tertiary education scene. Firstly, there's the acknowledged need for access and opportunity across a much wider base and a great desire out there to get educated. Secondly, we now have the technology and the pedagogy to satisfy that need with more excitement, more flexibility, and more chance of achieving success than ever before in history. So thirdly, what happens? We cut back the public resource in relation to the size of the need and open the possibility of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Let me offer you personal reflection on each of these three aspects. It might help you to understand, if I may say, my position if I told you that I come from a working class family background where my mum and dad left school at the ages of 12 and 11 respectively. And my twin brother and I only went to a university because somebody gave us a scholarship. And my mum and dad were wise enough and loving enough to tell us that there was no limit to what we could achieve with our brains if we cared to put our minds to it. My background, I might say, also includes 25 years in very traditional universities prior to moving to the University of Southern Queensland and encountering the incredible opportunities presented by leadership of an unknown, very dynamic, very flexible university that knows exactly where it's going in terms of educating people from 41 different nations in about 20 countries and with about 14,500 students studying in their own style, in their own place, in their own time. Your university is equally innovative. The need for tertiary education opportunities across a broad base is now an integral part of the changed social fabric of Australia. If you think education is expensive, you want to try ignorance. So, we should now turn our energies to making sure that the educational outcomes are of an appropriate quality and appropriate to the needs of the individual and the nation. In my opinion, the key emphasis of the past, namely whether a student is, quotes, good enough to be admitted to a university program, should shift inevitably towards the question of whether the student, having been admitted from one or other of many diverse backgrounds and skills bases, is good enough to graduate from a quality degree program. Universities should look much more at the quality of the person when he or she leaves the program rather than the quality of the person before he or she enters the program. Now, of course, decent universities have always cared about exit standards, but now an even greater vigilance is necessary so we can then be much more relaxed about the antenatal condition as we pay more attention to the confinement and the birth. This is very simplistic, I know. You can't get quality outcomes if you don't at least maintain a watching brief on who you admit. And even more important, you won't get quality outcomes unless you provide well-structured academic and administrative support, the possibility of remedial help, in the best sense of that word, and pedagogically sound learning programs. Turning to the issues of communications technology, I might say that no university has a greater vested interest in the use of advanced technology and the internet than my own or your own. A regional university, in my case, is very tempted to find new ways to attract students away from their traditionally more prestigious metropolitan rivals. All universities, including Griffith University, are in a highly competitive, cutthroat environment. Gimmickry, using the web or whatever, is a great temptation in the short term. But gimmickry without substance is death. The key characteristic of the new technologies, ladies and gentlemen, 
is not that they replace traditional methods, particularly, I might say, for young people having their first university experience on leaving school. Not that they replace that, but they provide an alternative delivery mechanism. Any observation of today's student population shows that there must be a range of delivery mechanisms. There is the need for flexibility and genuine choices, including, I might say, traditional study on campus, including also what I now refer to as traditional distance education, and including, of course, web-based learning. The most important driver for a successful tertiary education experience is not technology, but pedagogy. With the arrival of what we refer to now as the fourth generation delivery methodologies, uncluttered by time, place, and pace, we have to recognize that pedagogically sound learning strategies cross the boundaries between on and off campus study and cross the boundaries between disciplines. The one thing that's dead set certain about the future is that students will less and less choose their university on the basis of the locally available discipline content in the programs offered by the university. Discipline content will truly be derived from a worldwide knowledge base. Students might well decide to seek their credentials by accumulating frequent flyer points in units of study taken using content available from around the world. Students will be less concerned about whether old fools like me are good lecturers or not. They will be much more concerned with the level of personal support offered to supplement world-class content received via the web or otherwise. The absolutely hideous American phrase, the sage on the stage, will be replaced by the guide on the side, will have a ring of truth about it. And so finally, what about the resources or the lack of them? The position is very simple. The present level of public funding, if it continues to decline in real terms, will mean that no Australian can receive a quality education based upon that public funding alone. Fundamental aspects of quality learning, such as the ability to hire high quality staff, the provision of necessary teaching and research infrastructure, and the maintenance and upgrading of the supporting technologies will be unaffordable within the allocation of resources presently anticipated. Australian governments, whatever their political persuasion, simply have to realize that the slash and burn of the Vanstone era to which I believe many universities, including our own, responded very responsibly, have left many of our universities in poor financial positions. It's simply too much pain, too quickly. Too little resource within too little policy framework. Having said that, I refuse to be numbered amongst the vice chancellors who are pessimistic. Despite the excesses of the slash and burn, I believe that the challenge posed to the universities has been healthy as well as painful. As an engineer, my reaction to inadequate, inadequate public resource is to speak out loudly against the injustice of it, but at the same time to accept the data as they are and get on with the job of solving the problems. It's no good sitting back waiting for somebody else to solve your problems. The challenge to my university and to yours has been to identify our niche strengths, to openly proclaim what we're good at, to admit what we're poor at, and to concentrate upon contributions that we can make to a truly diverse Australian tertiary education system. Then, with clear objectives in mind, my university, as I'm sure is also the Griffith experience, has set out to resource its core business of teaching and learning, surrounded by scholarship and research, by responsible entrepreneurial activities. Full fee international and postgraduate students, contract services to the community, and genuine attempts to form partnerships with organizations possessing complementary skills are the bread and butter of survival. Providing we never forget that our core business 
is about teaching and learning. There is no reason whatsoever why we should not be innovative, entrepreneurial, and flexible in the way we conduct that business or how we resource it. In that sense, then, the slash and burn is very healthy and really sharpens the wits of those of us who work in the universities. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that being a vice-chancellor is a fabulous job. Being a university teacher, researcher, or student is a privilege still. And the opportunities ahead of us are so exciting that none of us should be pessimistic. I just hope that our politicians and our policy makers realize that Australia in the 21st century needs multicultural, multidisciplinary, readily available tertiary programs of the highest quality in order to remain the lucky country and be competitive in a global market. There exists in the leadership of the universities of this country a genuine will to provide access to all Australians who can benefit from tertiary study. We have a diverse university system which can become the envy of people around the world. Rather like with the internet, I hope that the federal government will recognize the need to minimize regulation, maximize incentives, and to place high on its agenda the development of the intellects of the Australian people in a time of immense financial and social change. Graduates, you're leaving the university uh, just when things are getting interesting. I'm delighted to be part of your evening, and I wholeheartedly congratulate you on the success in graduating from this excellent university. Deputy Chancellor, thank you for inviting me tonight. I'm going home to my little unit in Runaway Bay to have a beer and put out the cat. Thank you, Professor Swannell, for your relaxed but thought-provoking address to our graduates, families and friends here this evening. We are pleased that you were able to come down from the mountain to share your words of wisdom, and I can assure you, sir, that nothing which you have said this evening has gone over our heads, but has been taken very much to heart, as the issues you have raised are indeed the same issues of opportunities challenges and concerns that we face at Griffith University. The opportunities to access a wider base of potential students from all ages, social, economic, and cultural backgrounds is particularly exciting for Griffith University as we feel comfortably competitive with our multi-campus venues, each offering a unique study environment from South Bank in Brisbane, the native bush setting of Nathan, the sun and surf of our Gold Coast campus. Unfortunately, we are missing a mountain campus. As well, we see the challenge to deliver a quality product on or off campus with the correct balance of personal support, tutorial contact, and communication technology as a stimulating test of our university's entrepreneurial skills. And indeed, the sad fact that the politicians and bureaucrats in Canberra appear not to have been able to comprehend, as you so rightly pointed out, that education is a very real long-term investment and not just a cost. This is a real concern for all tertiary institutions in Australia today. Is it time, sir, for us to remind government that the visions of our educators is much, much longer than their term in office. <clears throat> With your observation that universities should look more at the quality of the person when he or she completes the program, rather than the qualities of the person before he or she enters the program, is one that we can certainly endorse. 
I am sure that the graduates who sit before us this evening would agree that they are individually more productive, more intellectually stimulated, and now possess those qualities to ably contribute to the betterment of their family, their community, and their country than they were before commencing their chosen degree and embarking in this new and exciting road of lifelong learning. I wish to add my congratulations to each one of our graduates here this evening. Well done. And may that wonderful feeling of achievement that you feel tonight stay with you every, in everything you strive for in life. Professor Solwell, we thank you again, and I would invite everyone to join me in expressing our appreciation in the normal manner. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this evening's graduation ceremony. When the fanfare of music commences, I'd ask you to stand and remain standing until the academic procession and the graduates have departed. Thank you. <laughs>